First item on the agenda is citizen comment. Any citizen wishing to render comment, please step forward to the podium on our left. State your name, your address, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Robert Gannell is first on the list, and he has a presentation also, so if you could raise your screens up, that'd be great. Thank you, Tila. There. I would ask the Commission's indulgence on the three minutes. I have a number of comments. Might take more like six or seven or eight uh, in light Any of my objections? None? participation on this. You are granted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first up, uh, I wanted to uh, follow up on the discussion of uh, the 50 foot. Is that from this machine? I'm hearing some feedback or something. Are we okay? Okay. Uh, follow up on the discussion from last time about uh, 50 foot versus uh, taller uh, support structures and antennas. Uh, I had made the uh, comment in terms of aesthetics and, and other uh, factors that uh, actually a taller structure is better even aesthetically. Uh, it, of course, it's better for us. It gets the signal up and out better. It's better in terms of potential for interference and RF exposure. But I, uh, I thought I would follow this up with a, a photo demonstration of this. Um, what I've done here, this is uh, the original photograph. This is actually from the manufacturer's website. This is a 72-foot crank-up structure with about a 10-foot mast on top of it. Uh, there are two HF horizontal antennas mounted at different elevations, and then at the very top, that T is a VHF horizontal antenna. So that is the very top at 82 feet. Um, this, to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, at that height, that is uh, higher than the 70 foot that we've been talking about, but uh, it still bears a good uh, example. And then, um, I don't, this is a photo that I've altered, I've taken that photo and altered it to what would be the 50 foot height, pulling the top of the structure down to the 50 foot limit right there. And uh, so I wanted, oops, that's not mine, to demonstrate if you're, for example, across the street, and this is your view, not that this would be a typical view around here, but the idea was the taller structure gets the antennas, which are actually the larger part of the visual obstruction, up and out of the way, versus the shorter structure being, brings them right down into the field of view around the home. Uh, next point, if it is around here, uh, this is a common HF vertical antenna. Uh, this is a much more economical approach than putting in a big support structure and the, and the horizontal antennas and uh, would be more, uh, more popular, more common since this is about a $500 antenna versus several thousands of dollars of cost for, say, that uh, crank up structure we were just looking at. Um, with, this is a 20 foot, 28 foot tall antenna, and as uh, the documentation has said, these antennas typically range up to about 30 feet. Uh, this is a very popular model in this photo. I'm going to increase its size a little bit there so we can see it. And this is on a uh, roof mount, obviously. Uh, this is the preferred installation for this. Uh, but because of its height, 28 feet, obviously combining that with the height of a house, if you're at 22 or above would preclude the roof mount and in most cases that would force the radio operator to put it on the ground instead or on a short mast in the yard. Um, this has several drawbacks uh, not only for the for the operator but um, it uh, because these radiate out typically at an angle of 15 to 30 degrees in terms of their maximum signal strength, it brings that signal right down onto the ground and sends it right out through the neighboring homes instead of having it up above. And uh, also it means that in terms of obviously RF uh, interference potential, 
uh, there's a greater possibility there. RF exposure is obviously an issue. Um, the, it requires then that the amateur actually control the space around the antenna because a person could get RF burns if they were actually close or hanging, holding on to the antenna at the time of transmission. So it's very advantageous to have it up higher. So in this regard then the uh, something like a 65 or 70 foot height limit would be more accommodating to that, uh, that scenario. Uh, along the lines of that 65 foot uh, wanted to discuss some various options, and these are things we could discuss later uh, if you want to, about uh, different options other than just a flat height for all residential, all in amateur antenna types. There are options we could discuss. Uh, we discussed Redmond's regulation last time, and uh, they do have the 65-foot 65 65 foot limit instead of the 50 that's being proposed here. Um, it was noted that they do also have some regulations in terms of uh, uh, painting or potentially painting or other uh, view mitigation uh, factors. I think, I'll, I'll let Brian speak for himself, but I think we would rather have the 65 foot height with the potential of having to do something of uh, view mitigation rather than the 50 foot limit and obviously then the 65 would be more accommodating to uh, the vertical example I just gave. Um, Edmonds also has a similar regulation. They have a 65 foot uh, height and uh, a similar mitigation potential. Um, moving on, uh, one of the options you might consider is uh, a, a taller limit for larger lots. I know that there are two, divi two general divisions of the residential lots in the memo from staff right now, and I believe those are based on size. Uh, obviously, a larger lot would be probably more inclined to have more trees and uh, obviously more surrounding area to the uh, neighboring lots. So if you can't see your way to accommodate a higher limit for all residences, at least those who have the, the lot to accommodate it uh, would be uh, a, a benefit. Um, since uh, I, I've sort of covered the aesthetic here, I did want to make a point about aesthetics. Uh, my intent is not to I can, aesthetics are hard to argue, and obviously you're charged with representing the community aesthetic. Uh, but I do want to point out the, the subjective and ephemeral nature of that uh, with a case in point, and that is that our, uh, our typical suburban homes now, even in the most strict covenant neighborhoods, are typically fronted by a two or three car garage, which actually juts out from the home quite typically, and itself is fronted by a concrete driveway. Uh, that aesthetic would have been utterly unacceptable in most cities for most of the American history, and in fact is being rejected now by a, a new urban aesthetic also. Um, now I value my garage as much as the next fellow does, but uh, you see the argument that uh, uh, not everyone finds antennas necessarily aesthetically objectionable. Uh, finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, amateur radio and public service. Uh, I shared some information with staff and they passed it on to you in one of the memos la for the last meeting uh, in a summarized, um, summarized version. I wanted to talk a little bit about Ken Moore's situation in particular since we were talking about what antennas there are in Kenmore, and particularly HF antennas, and uh, most of this uh, discussion does concern HF antennas. Um, I served in the Emergency Service Coordinating Agency for 13 years until it was dissolved this past December, uh, known as ESCA. That was a consortium of 10 cities, seven in Snohomish County, three in King County, including Kenmore. I, so I'm giving you some background. I'm not sure how familiar you are with this. Uh, it was a uh, quasi-governmental entity formed to provide emergency management for the uh, member cities. Uh, the cities uh, sought to dissolve it for monetary 
political and staffing reasons. <laughs> uh, I won't go into that. Uh, but we had two very fine volunteer groups, one uh, amateur radio group known as RACES, that stands for Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, and the other is a community emergency response team group. And uh, uh, as I had mentioned in the documentation to um, to staff, and I think it was mentioned in the memo, uh, our volunteer groups were so uh, so well run and uh, so professional that we were asked to take on uh, handling public service events as far as as far as way as Montana and Alaska. Uh, unfortunately, those groups are now dissolved along with ESCA. Some members have joined Snohomish County DEM. Uh, their radio group. Some are waiting and planning to join a group to be founded under uh, what's called North Shore Emergency Management Coalition, which will be Kenmore, Lake Forest Park, and the North Shore Fire District. Um, at the end of ESCA, I, in addition to my 13 years of service, I was training officer for about 10 years, uh, the last 10 years, and uh, in that sense was responsible for training program content at each of the meetings as well as uh, conducting licensing classes. Uh, one of the things, we, we did a lot of training, we did a lot of exercises, we got very good at it. One of the things that I can't train is HF experience. The operator has to have that facility at home. We had a, a minimal HF uh, setup at Briar, not even as good as what uh, Brian has at his home. Um, currently, well, first of all, currently Kenmore basically has no emergency management until that coalition is formed. You have no volunteer group until that's formed. Um, if you walk in, you can see our one antenna up there, which is only a VHF, UHF antenna used for localized communications. You have no HF capability because that was at Briar, because that was the ESCA headquarters. Uh, if the Cascadia event were to happen today, the only existing facility in the city of Kenmore that would be capable of communication outside the region, which would be critical as the scenario actually calls for, would be Bryan Station. Uh, so um, it, it is uh, in the interest of the city to, to keep as flexible a policy as possible in addressing the, and allowing these structures to be, uh, these antennas and structures to be uh, put up so that the, uh, we will have a core of HF operators who will get experience on their own and will have those facilities in place at that time. So that concludes my comments. Thank, Thank you, you, Robert. You have a sign-in sheet? Brian Winger. Step on up, Brian. Yep. Uh, yep. This guy over here. Yep. Great. I don't need a microphone. Uh, Robert and I didn't compare notes. So I'm just going to wing it here. Uh, question was asked last week or last meeting. Uh, the four thousand dollars for a conditional use permit was onerous. In my opinion, it is. Um, last numbers I saw for median family income in Kenmore were somewhere between eighty and ninety thousand bucks. Uh, payroll wages, you know, payroll taxes being what they are, you've got to make six to take home four. It's a lot. In fact, uh, the cost of the, of the tower and the installation of the tower is enough to put off most ham radio operators without throwing an extra $4,000 at it. It's a lot of money. Um, as noted last time, most of the surrounding jurisdictions have no tower requirements. Kenmore currently has no height restrictions on amateur radio towers. Uh, the two jurisdictions that do are Redmond and Edmonds are both at 65 feet. Um, a good friend of mine put up a 65 foot tower in Edmonds, right in the View Corridor, um, Ocean View neighborhood. His permit was 200 bucks. Um, 65 feet is a reasonable number. As uh, Robert pointed out, many, many amateur radio antennas work better at that height. Uh, below that, uh, their performance is compromised. Um, they pick up more noise, they, they have the potential to cause more interference. Uh, 65 is a real good number. I can see why um, Edmonds and, and Redmond both went for it. I 
I think the uh, proposal last time to go with 50 feet is um, a real hardship for potential hams, and the cost to uh, try to go beyond that is, um, you know, exorbitant, in my opinion. Um, this is a situation where there hasn't been a problem for 18 years, and um, I'm curious to know what the um, compelling government or public interest there would be in adopting a more restrictive standard than 65 feet. Um, if you're going to, you know, pick a number, I'd encourage you to pick that one. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Ken Lyons. Good evening. My name is uh, Ken Lyons of Bush Law Firm on behalf of AT&T. Um, Carol Tagayan couldn't be here. Uh, she was here the last uh, few meetings, so I, I am here. And it's really nice because I'm just uh, down the road. I live in Lake Forest Park, so my address is 17533 47th Avenue Northeast in Lake Forest Park. Um, thank you for this opportunity to address the commission tonight and uh, look at, I understand you've had really a number of productive meetings talking about the, where you would like to see wireless uh, where you see the city's wireless future um, looking like. It's important to note that uh, the world's changed. The world changed in the last 10 years. Uh, we were a landline society for 100 years. In the last 10 years, we've rapidly gone wireless. It's been that quick. Uh, the trends are there. If you look at uh, not just where 911 calls come over, it's over 70%. If you look at the number of uh, people that use their, their wireless phone exclusively and don't even have a home phone, it's 45% King County. If you include people that actually have a home phone, but it's really only just for those who are getting those uh, pesky marketing calls. Um, you know, the closer it jumps over to over 70 percent. So people clearly depend on their wireless phones. Um, and of course, in the last since the iPhone, you can always tell when there's a, kind of the pre-iPhone regulations and post-iPhone regulations because, you know, certainly uh, in the last uh, uh, seven years, AT&T has had a hundred thousand percent increase in data traffic. So the trends are rapidly you know, going wireless. It's a, really a tremendous shift in how people communicate. And it, and it changes the way from a po policy perspective how uh, sites have to be built. Uh, I'll just be brief in just trying to describe the concerns that we have about the ordinance. Most of them are outlined in the letter that my colleague uh, had submitted a, a few weeks ago. But I think we're, in fair, you know, we're deeply concerned about the uh, draft use table. We believe that it will pr either prohibit, ser uh, prohibit service um, or prohibit wireless facilities in most parts of the city or constructively prohibit. In other words, the, even the places where you're saying that you would like facilities to go, the requirements cannot reasonably be met given the constraints that are there. So we believe that there are uh, deep, uh, significant problems with the Telecom Act uh, with this. Uh, we believe that there's issues with case law uh, and certainly in the preference for technology. There is case law that prevents local government from essentially preferring one type of technology like small cell or DAS over other types of technologies like uh, macro sites. Um, we also think the uh, characterization of how co-locations is uh, looked upon in this, at least in this particular chart, and again, this, there's not a lot of information here, but it appears to be somewhat inconsistent with the new FCC rule, which was published uh, last year and went into effect. Um, so, you know, the other concern, of course, is this is a, this is a place where I live, and it's uh, certainly close by to where I live, and, and uh, I don't know if the code really reflects, at least in my view, the unique and diverse topography and vegetation you find without the city. Certainly, you can understand why you don't want certain types of facilities in certain places, but, um, um, but, you know, the city isn't just all one way. There's, uh, there's uh, places where there's hills, there's places where there's lots of topography, and so making sure that the, the code is flexible enough, uh, not just looking at pure zoning districts, but flexible enough to encourage the type of development that you would like to see. Finally, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, newer um, kinds of stealth technology out there. I mean, before when monopines and monofurs, those types of things used to be built, they look like Charlie Brown Christmas trees, you know, with the little branches hanging off, and they are clearly cell towers with a couple of branches. They're a lot better today. In fact, you're seeing uh, much more adoption of them because they, they actually can look like real trees, and uh, they don't stand out uh, when they're certainly placed appropriately with other trees that are around there. Um, I think the true test of looking at a policy like this, and probably a concern, is that, you know, even almost every site would require a variance, if not all. So, and it, whereas sites aren't prohibited, and you can't get a variance for use, um, every site that uh, would be built in the city, even under your current regulations, would require a variance because there's no, they don't provide basic 
a basic enough height or the basic design of flexibility needed to provide meaningful coverage. And so it creates this conflict whether or not it's good policy to adopt something that requires an exception every time to be used. And we would just uh, encourage the commission and the city to perhaps consider uh, some flexible things to ensure that we protect the things that you're most concerned about views but still allow for some flexibility for these things to be built. And I'm available for questions if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like it exhausts. Can I ask, I'm sorry, could I ask Ken a question while he's here, or should I say? I'm, I'm open to that. I was going to say something. Thanks. Uh, otherwise, but go ahead. Ken, you referenced uh, an SEC rule. Is that, did I hear F you correctly? FCC. Oh, you did say FCC. Okay. Mm. That's the only question I have. Yeah. No, not Securities and Exchange okay. Commission. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Go ahead, Deborah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember the letter, and I know we have it, but can you just very, very briefly say what specific constraints? Are the issue, you, you alluded to height, but is there something else? And, and where specifically and with what kind of device um, would the height be an issue? So uh, looking at your, uh, the, the use table that was uh, handed out, to, um, or I guess in your packet tonight, um, basically, so towers themselves are prohibited from most zones. Right, and you're relying pretty much on going on utility poles, and the, but there's a height limit of 10 feet, on the, or a fixed height limit of 45 feet, whichever is lower. That's a constructor prohibition because you can't actually meet the safety clearances that PSE, the, who the pole owner is, to actually put your antennas on there and and still be able to meet those height limits, which means they would it's constructively prohibited, and you'd have to ask for an exception every time. That's an example of one. Does that answer your question? in part. So are you saying that all of the ones that you would install with on utility poles would be more than 10 feet above the top of the pole? Yes. Um, and, and also, you have to keep in mind, uh, certainly in, in your code, um, a lot of the height limits that were in the old code, 60 feet to 120 feet, were done away with and drop to basically the zone height limit, which might be 30, 35, 40 feet, as the case might be. Uh, uh, a wireless carrier is typically not going to build a site that low because um, with the clutter, in other words, building, topography, vegetation, you're not going to provide meaningful coverage with that. So in other words, you'd have to have something taller than that just to either clear trees or clutter to be able to do it. So that's another example. Anybody else? Go ahead, Dennis. Hmm. This may be uh, out of the ballpark, but are there any sort of model um, recommendations of those type of technical requirements that might be used for the zoning and, and land use uh, departments to consider? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of good models. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say models because every city is unique. and. Uh, you know, it's funny, I was over in Spokane, they were adopting ordinance, they were looking at Mount Lake Terraces. I'm like, well, Spokane's a much larger city than Mount Lake Terrace. It's not exactly an apples to apples comparison, but um, I'll t kind of take that in parts. Uh, when it relates to the new FCC rule, that just relates to co-locations and upgrades on existing sites. There's model language that was put out by the National League of Cities, the National Association of Counties, and I, that was provided um, to staff uh, several months ago. Uh, PCIA has a model ordinance um, that, uh, again, it talks um, to, um, and, and you see this feature in quite a few codes around here, where you express a preference of where you want sites to go, and, and the, basically the lower, you, if you can't go in an industrial zone, you have to go in a commercial zone. If you can't go in, so you go down, and obviously going into a residential zone is the least. And you have to show why you can't go into one of those more intense or types of zones. That's a common feature. A lot of the codes around here have them. I think Woodenville adopted a, uh, a, a code a few years ago, which is, which is very reasonable and does take into consideration a lot of new stealth technology, which I think might be helpful. There are not a lot of good models out there for small cells or DAS systems as of yet, um, just because it's a, new, a newer type of technology. But it, you know, they're typically not going to be deployed in an environment like this unless it's just along the Bothellway corridor type of thing because of, it's, a, it's a capacity driven, not a coverage tool, if you will. So yeah, there's a lot of models. And we're happy to provide examples or example language if you guys have a concern about a specific thing, I'm sure that there's a good model of how some other city had dealt with that particular issue that could even be adapted if it's helpful. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mark? 
Yeah, I asked this question last time uh, to um, your, I guess your your colleague. Um, do you do uh, local projections of, of demand increase for data services, uh, such as in in Kenmore or, or locally? And, and and if so, what might I mean? You referenced the hundred thousand increase in traffic in seven years. Do you have anything we can sort of take a look at that's that's a more local projection going going forward? Um, I don't have anything specifically local, except that um, there are a couple things that are tracked locally. Uh, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC publishes a report um, every six months to a year that talks about wireless-only usage. So it, it kind of talks to, again, that trend of, in King County, if you, if you measure it against the rest of the country, is certainly much more wireless, much more. So I would certainly expect that those trends that I gave you, about the 100,000 percent being uh, a national number, are right. certainly true here, if not more. Uh, but there are some local things, but they're typically tracked for, you know, by other gov government agencies. Right. If I could just follow up. And so um, because you mentioned the topography, too, are you sort of suggesting that, that your new facilities would, would tend to be located in higher areas, or is that something you can't necessarily say without obviously a lot of study? Yeah, I think if you look at the, the development of wireless over the last, history over the last 30 years, um, Certainly all the sites used to be located on the big hill, right? And then they started getting closer and closer to people. You know, the, the challenge is, is if you look at where the, the demand is really growing, it's growing in residential areas. That's where people are using their phones. They're getting rid of their home phones to go wireless only. And so, it, you know, the idea that we can locate in a commercial area or on top of the hill or just in, uh, along a highway as being the primary focus really, I think, ignores where the real trend and demand really is. The truth is the wireless has to be or near everywhere in order to provide that level of service. That doesn't mean that it, ha it, it, that, um, it, it has to be a, a terrible looking thing or it's just got to be a monopole and not screen. There's, it, it's, it's more, it's, instead of having a location-based code that says go here before you go here, it's really about going turning towards more design. We have to be everywhere. So how do you design the facilities so that they're the most appropriate they can be in the context of the, of the neighborhood they're trying to serve? Yeah. Anybody else? I had a couple of questions, Ken, if yeah. you're willing. Uh, and this is a follow-up to Commissioner Srebnik's question about, and I think you said that the height limits that we adopted conflict with our, or, or at least are constructively prohibitive because they conflict with PSE's requirements, is that right? I was talking specifically for utility poles in that case. So monopoles or even stealth facilities, as I read your, uh, your use chart, would be, is envisioned to be banned from most of the city. So the only alternative to build a wireless facility is being pushed to either a rooftop if the rooftop is of sufficient height to, to go on, or to a utility pole. I was just pointing out that the utility poles are essentially are constructively prohibited because they don't, you know, they don't consider the uh, separation requirements that are not of our own doing. It's uh, Puget Sound Energy as a pole owner is required to maintain safety requirements from their power lines uh, for the safe operation of uh, the antennas above them. So. So we have a what ten foot limit above the existing pole? Is that mm -hmm. it? And you're, Mm -hmm. You need more height from that, or you need to restore the monopole allowance? So on the utility poles, to give you an example, um, safety requirements are dependent on how much voltage, how much power the, uh, the power lines are actually carrying. And they can range. The separation between the lines and the bottom of the antennas is anywhere between 7 feet to 15 feet to the bottom of the antenna. So if you have antennas above that, you know, typically between 6 or 8 feet, let's just say 8 feet, so if you have 15 feet of separation plus 8 feet, that you really have to have at least 22 feet just to meet the minimum uh, separation requirements that, uh, that they would have. So, you know, sorry. Go ahead. No. Sorry. So uh, I think that's one of the challenges. And, and then also, typically, with the amount of demand that we're seeing, we're usually seeing two sets of antennas. On, uh, so that means they're stacked on top of each other. So if you have an eight-foot set of antennas, then you have another eight feet on top of it. So if you have 15 feet, you know, and you have two sets of eight, you can imagine the amount of height on top of the pole, you know, is certainly much taller than 10 feet would suggest. So I think our adopted rule was that you could apply if you're presumptively permitted up to 10 feet above the existing pole, but then you could apply for a conditional use permit if you needed 
if you could prove the criteria under the conditional use permit, which would include this is essential for us to operate and provide this kind of coverage and service, and there are no reasonable alternatives to it. Mm -hmm. So that you could make your case to the, to, to, I think, the head of development services for getting a higher, higher pole or, or a different pole. Yeah, I think that your criteria, though, is entirely focused on whether or not we need the additional height. And in this case, it's not so much that we need the additional height. It's because the separation, it has to do with a technical safety separation that's not even a criteria under the code. In other words, if we needed that 15 feet of separation, you know, we, you know, that's not found in your criteria as an allowable exception. The only reason why you're able to get more height is if you can prove a gap in coverage. Does that make sense? No, it's I'm it's so safe. Confused. Sorry. Well, you need the addition. Let's say you need to locate a utility mm -hmm. pole because you don't have a reasonable alternative, and you're saying that the utility pole rules or the height don't allow you to build the the, the, the antenna that you want. Is that right? Yeah. And then well, you could go mm -hmm. to the city and say, "Look, this, this we can't fit within your regulation. Regulation. We have to get a conditional use permit. Here are the reasons why. I thought the reasons were related to." keep primarily the essential need of using that tower and getting an exception to accommodate your antenna. Mm -hmm. And if you make that case to the head of development services, you can get that permit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it requires an, basically an exception. Uh, right. to, yeah, and all, all I was pointing out is that on the last page of the uh, use table, there's, it looks like uh, envisioned criteria. Right. And I didn't see you know, safety separation from PSE as an allowed, allowable reason why you could get additional height. I thought the language is more general. Uh, yeah, you could make your case within the scope of the existing language, and that would be one of the reasons that would justify getting the exception. Yeah. The safety considerations require us to have mm -hmm. a different kind of antenna. So we need the mm -hmm. permit. We need an exception for that kind of antenna. And maybe it would be good to write that into here. Of course, I, the only thing I would say mention is that, you know, there's, there's a categorically, we can never meet the 10 feet, is all I'm saying. You know, the, the 10 feet... You know, it's 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 unreasonable on its face because it doesn't consider even the minimum height of antennas or the minimum separation that we would have well, to unless have. Unless you had a rooftop alternative. Yeah, I was talking about utility. Well, there was poles. an existing grandfathered yeah. monopole, right? That you could co-locate on. Yeah, well, monopoles, existing uh, co-locations and stuff is really an issue because again, the new FCC rule basically preempts you know that. Um, but when it comes to building new facilities. Um, I would assume this new code would apply and it would become restrictive because you um, are prohibitive because there's no way you can actually meet the criteria on the face, right? In that limited situation, but then again, you have the exception option. So my other question is, mm -hmm. you, you have a problem with the rules that we've adopted. We look closely at the rules of surrounding cities mm -hmm. and we modified our, the original proposal accordingly. Are, are you saying too that you think that the surrounding cities, I know you said Woodenville was a pretty good model, but Kirkland and Redmond and Shoreline and Bothell, are they unsatisfactory also? Well, I, I will say this. They have difficult processes, but at least they allow the option of constructing if you can make your case. Um, the, the challenge is, is that right, what you have in this particular draft is you have a use restriction for which there is no variance. So if you had to build a tower or a monopine or what, as the case might be, even if it was stealth, um, there's no actual mechanism to even apply, whereas in those other cities like Kirkland or Redmond or Bothell or Woodenville, there would be a mechanism to apply. And in some places like Woodenville, they've actually incentivized one type of design over another. So if you apply for a monopine or a monifer, and it fits with, within these requirements, there's actually an easier process for that kind of thing, whereas if you build something that's less stealth, you have a much more difficult process and much more difficult burden of proof to show why you need that. So, okay. yeah. That's all I have for now. Okay. You might want to stick around. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? No? So I had in mind, thank you, Ken, again. Uh, as, as you all know, this is an exception to the standard citizen comment process for us to ask questions, but we've done it before, particularly with the expertise of the people commenting. And my thought was, we could get the staff to respond to these comments. They're very specific, they're technical. I have some thoughts, I'd like to hear their thoughts on it, and then we could perhaps bring back some of the citizens to be able to re rebut or uh, comment on what the staff says. Does that sound agreeable? Okay, all right. Thank you, all citizens, for your comments. I have to say they were very to the point, substantive, and thought-provoking. Appreciate it.
I know a lot of time went into it. All right, so I invite the staff to the presentation table. Next time item on the agenda is the communications facility element continued. Go ahead. Oh, did I miss it? I missed it. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. I, uh, okay, so going back on the agenda, that item, approval of minutes. Do I hear a motion to approve the January 19, 2016 Planning Commission meeting minutes? Do I hear a second? Second. All right, uh, any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed, raise your hand and say nay. Any abstention? Motion carries, the minutes are approved. Thank you, Dennis. Staff. Good evening. So I think what I heard you ask is for me to respond to the comments from the three uh, citizens who are here to speak tonight. Thanks. So I'll do my best. Um, Mr. Grinnell uh, certainly um, has in the past mentioned that he believes that a taller structure is better not just for performance, but aesthetically. Uh, the question about how tall that should be, I know that uh, they're interested, the ham radio group is interested in a 65 to 70 foot height. Uh, staff continues to believe that a 50 foot height limit with a requirement that a conditional use permit be required if uh, a taller height is desired um, is appropriate. Uh, for Mr. Wingert, he is certainly concerned about the conditional use permit fee. I understand that. As you saw in my memo, the, um, we checked with the city attorney about the feasibility of reducing the fee. And the bottom line is that you cannot have a differential fee unless there's really something different about the permits. It would be, for example, if you gave one group a break on the fees with no... Um, explanation for that is considered a gift of public funds, which is illegal. <laughs> so the, the issue with the conditional use permit is that you would have to make an argument that a conditional use permit for a ham radio tower would take less time and effort than a conditional use permit for any other type of application. And I think that would be difficult to do, particularly given that uh, in a sense it would be most likely in a residential neighborhood and there would be a lot of citizen input. Those are the kinds of permits that take the most time to process. So on that basis, I don't think you could make an argument uh, for a differential fee. Uh, the other approach that the city attorney had suggested would be a contractual um, agreement that in exchange for public service, a reduced fee could be provided. In other words, if the uh, radio operator was willing to sign a contract saying, I will commit to providing public service, uh, maybe there would be an opportunity for a reduced fee. I have not heard from um, either Mr. Grinnell or Mr. Winger that that is something that they would be willing to do. It puts them in an awkward spot if they are not participating in that way or, or um, cannot consistently contribute in that way. So uh, that would be a question for them. Uh, but that would be the other um, opportunity to provide for a differential fee. Uh, as far as Mr. Lyons' concerns, I am, I am just tonight hearing about the separation requirement. There are a couple of comments I might make about that. We assumed that utility poles were 40 feet in height. I suppose it's possible you could have a 35 foot utility pole. Um, again, it's a separation requirement, I think, for a certain type of antenna. Uh, so I would ask that uh, Mr. Lyons provide more detailed information about that, specifically what type of antenna, since we've certainly seen um, examples of smaller scale antennas on top of utility poles that were not that tall, and um, a, a 
argument for if you need 7 to 15 feet of a separation, what you would intend to put on top of that, because it's getting pretty tall <laughs> uh, at that point, and why that is a pref preferable option to, for example, putting it on a non-residential building in a residential zone, for example. I think that we... Uh, have tried to do what he had suggested, which was to identify areas uh, of priority about where the community would prefer to have um, communication facilities located. We went through a uh, prioritization exercise, and so hopefully the decisions that you've made reflect that, that you don't want them in the view areas, you don't really want them in the residential areas. So I think the, the uh, proposed uh, policy directions do achieve that. Uh, the stealth technology is actually something that we would talk about tonight. And, and certainly stealth technology is an important component of discussing communication facilities. And the city currently has some comments about uh, wanting stealth technology. And if it's getting better, that's great. And, and I would support uh, that. I'm not certain that every site would require a variance. That assumes that every location in the city is, is uh, prohibitive, and that is not the case in the table. There are areas where towers are permitted, and certainly areas even in residential zones where uh, non-residential facilities could house uh, rooftop antennas, for example. So I'm looking forward to receiving more specific information about what separation requirements are that will help us determine whether that's a direction the commission wants to go in terms of utility poles. And, um, and then just more information on really why some of these other options would not work. I, I don't know that we need to go into the process assuming there has to be a, a tower or monopole in every um, zone in the city. So it's my perspective. Thank you, Lori. So if anybody wants uh, the citizens who've commented to respond to Lori, you're welcome to bring that up. If not, I know we have a motion on the table. We started discussion of it. We had a raised, seconded discussion. Because of the late time of the meeting last time, we held over further discussion. So I'm open to either approach. Deborah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, feel free. Oh, um, so the issue, and I, I don't know which maybe to address, but the issue of public service, I mean, it seems like kind of on the face of it that the a major purpose of the ham radio operators, particularly the high frequency, is this emergency services. Um, and so I'm, I'm confused about why that wouldn't, it would need to be contractual. It right. can't be that um, I Understood. intend Un understood. to. So so it's, why is that not a possibility? I, I don't know. And that's not a question for me. It's probably okay. for our operators right. okay. and, and their group. And that they may be willing to. I, I, that's just not something that I have heard from them. Because that would seem to be the trade-off. It's like if we, you know, if we allow the 65 feet, we're doing it for a public good, so to speak, um, and that that should, that would justify the, the, you know, not having a permit fee. I mean, it'd be nice to not have that permit fee. <laughs> but the city so. attorney said that that was a way, it may not right. be the complete, yeah. um, so. uh, the complete fee, but certainly a portion of it. So I think that's a question for. So would it be our, okay if they commented on that? And I'm, for, I'm open to that. Are there any objections? If Deb or anybody else wants to ask one of the citizens, Brian, Robert, can come up and respond to their questions. I'm, I think it's fine. And if there are no objections, then go right ahead. Well, that's the question <laughs> around the contract. The, I'll just ask, yeah, or, yeah, or invite the, somebody to come up to the podium. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I hadn't given it a lot of thought, but something just popped into my mind. Um, well, first of all, I would, I would point you to the uh, the last page of the um, the current memo, January 26, addressing the amateur radio, because one of the uh, provisions that allows for, um, well, it's an additional provision for the conditional use permit is to support emergency operations in Kenmore. Um, 
and in the case of a residential site, I think B would be automatically excluded. You don't have an alternate site. It is your home, and C would, would have to be addressed. But um, so in that vein, you've already asked for public service to accommodate that additional, um, that additional height under a conditional use permit. Uh, I personally, having been involved in that aspect of public service, wouldn't have a problem personally with signing such a contract. I can't speak for all of my amateur radio operators, but there is another problem which is much larger, I think. Um, since it would be a contractual quid pro quo, uh, in other words, we're getting the benefit of the $4,000 fee being removed in exchange for our service, that would violate the FCC regulations regarding the amateur service. We're forbidden from accepting compensation uh, for our radio service. And I'm sure the IRS would have, be interested in that too, but you can imagine if the IRS would collapse that into a $4,000 benefit, the FCC would also see it that way. So uh, I think it would fail in that regard. I would point out that we based that on that suggestion of waiving the fee on the Edmonds regulation. So if it's illegal, then Edmonds is uh, uh, in violation in their current code. So. Uh, Anything else? I, I would ahead, offer two comments regarding that. One is, um, speaking earlier to my, for, for example, vertical antenna uh, demonstration, uh, that's a $500 antenna, and uh, a $4,000 fee to install it is, is just ridiculous. $4,000 is more in line of what it would take to install the, the crank-up structure and all of the, the ground facility that's necessary for it. Um, so if the, if the $4,000 conditional use for permit fee has to stay in place, uh, I really encourage the commission to go up to the 65 or 70 foot level so that that can be avoided in, in most circumstances. Uh, and, and in regard to that and the continued recommendation about 50 feet, uh, we have presented several scientific and uh, factual based cases for why the 65 to 70 foot uh, limit is, is preferable. I'm not sure I understand why the staff chose 50 feet uh, other than just it's just sort of a seat of the pants judgment. I would be interested in hearing the justification for that. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Anybody? The question. <laughs> I see a lot of people can thinking here. Have Lori to address that question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. The 50 foot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Anybody can ask. Yeah. If, if you want to ask Lori a question, <laughs> yeah. go ahead. Right. So the 50 foot justification in a residential zone is a seat of the pants. Uh, I don't have a magic crystal ball. I think everyone knows what a 35 foot tall house looks like, and I think about 15 more feet on top of that, the equivalent of another story and a half, potentially, and I think about what I would feel like sitting in my house if I looked next door and saw something that big going up. I think that to go to 65 or 75, or 65 or 70 feet, I would be shocked. So it's, it's a personal reaction. But sometimes, when you're thinking about things, that's the only reaction you can have. Anybody else? Yeah, please. <laughs> so what's the delta between 50 feet and 65 feet in terms of uh, you know, performance? You mentioned there's a degradation. Could you, could you address that maybe a little more specifically in terms of how much difference it makes in terms of the performance of these with that uh, apparent delta? Here? Yeah, I mentioned at the last meeting that a friend of mine in Redmond was putting up a tower um, the following weekend, the weekend following meeting. He got that up. Uh, he finished um, running cables to it Wednesday night and it was operational Thursday morning. Um, one um, ham radio activity that we both participate in is something called DXing. There's uh, 340 countries around the world. About 250 of them have people in them. The rest of them are little islands and stuff that are um, you know, part of countries like uh, um, uh, Wake Island, you know, it's part of the United States and there's nobody on it. It's a, um, you know, a 
wildlife habitat, but periodically the, the Fish and Game Department gives some hams the opportunity to go activate it, and they're on the radio for a week or two, and the whole world's you know, trying to get a hold of them. Well, there's a bunch of guys freezing their butts off down in the Antarctic right now, but it's summertime down there, and they're all wearing these big puffy you know, Michelin tire uh, down jackets, and they're running radios, and they went on the air um, uh, Friday morning. Um, I've been working my butt off playing on the radio for the last several days, and so far I've contacted them three times um, you know, four or five days here. Uh, my buddy in Redmond, uh, he's got a tower he just fired up Thursday morning. It's at 93 feet, and he's contacted them, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 times in different bands. He just turns on the radio, works them, turns it off, goes on with something else. <laughs> Um, in my neighborhood, my antenna is down at 45 feet. Um, the radio signals on, the, on the, the gauge of my radio go from 1 to 9. When I turn on my uh, radio, my antenna, and point it down to the Antarctic, the noise level is at 9. That's the buzz from my neighbor's plasma TVs, our LED lights, and their fence for their dog, and all this other RF crap. And the fact I'm at 45 feet, I'm listening to their buzz instead of listening to these guys in the Antarctic. But it's a miracle that I was able to, to reach them. Can I interject here, and if you don't mind? I know this is your question. No, but good. If I, I think what you're making is an argument to say that height gives us way more capacity and performance. And I'm, I'm sorry, what? The height, the additional height, 50 to 65 or 70 feet, Gives you way more capacity and broad it's, it's bandwidth and, and performance quality, and it works better. And I get that. I mean, what you're saying is, noise. look, this guy with a taller antenna has way more capacity and ability to, to get to yes, Antarctic sir. to talk to Antarctica than I do. Yeah, I think we could all stipulate to that. I think what I'm more interested in, and I suspect Commissioner Orenshaw is too, is is there the performance level is in utterly inadequate at 50 feet, and the extra 15 would get you into a you know a much greater level of adequacy for the purposes of public service does. and it safety benefits. And that's what I, I'm, I'm kind of listening for something specific about how much more and how much is needed and how high, you know, what's the minimum height we can tolerate to still perform the vast majority of our public safety functions. Well, Does that make sense? I'm a liberal, liberal arts guy, not an engineering guy. But um, it's not linear. It, it's somewhat exponential going from 50 to 65 is, is a, a big step up in performance. Going from 65 to 90, yeah, it's better at 90. At 65, 70, you're kind of in a sweet spot um, for you know, propagation in general, um, particularly domestic propagation. You know, in case of emergency, you're trying to get to you know, the Midwest or the East Coast or something out of this area. 65 is the number you want to be at. Less than that, it's, it degrades pretty rapidly. I mean, you can't. You're, you would you would have a hard time putting a reliable reliable number on the level of degradation at 50. Like the per, the quality is reduced from 90 percent capacity to 60 percent. Sunspot cycle. Yeah. Um, okay, I understand. I'm just throwing it out there and seeing if we. Yeah, it's get, it's get something it's enough measurable. that I'm standing here. I'm sorry. It's enough that I'm standing here, you know, <laughs> trying to persuade you guys to go 15 feet higher. It's it's not linear. It's it's more than that. Okay. And they're, they, you know, 70, 80 would be nice, but there's just not that. The next 15 feet really doesn't buy you that much. Um, capping at 65 is, is a reasonable number, and I think that's why the other jurisdictions went with it. But I, I've got S9 noise at my house. I'm screwed. You know, um, I'd really like to have another 20 feet. And uh, my, my problem is my pocketbook. And, of course, you know, if you pass this thing, you know, it's more of a problem. Okay, I'm going to return the questioning to the vice chair because you were nice enough to let me interject on your question, but you had the floor, so I return it to you. I'd like to add on to Go ahead. Robert, I'd like to. I do have a couple things to address your question. Well, Mark, you have the floor. Certainly, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, two different angles on this. First of all, the, um, there was a document I shared with staff. I'm not sure if it was passed on to you or not, Antana Height. And uh, let's see, you got the full and communications effectiveness. Did you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the executive summary, 
uh, for example, a, a beam type of antenna, that was the type that I was showing you earlier atop the crank up tower, a beam type of antenna at the height of 70 feet or more will provide greatly superior performance over the same antenna at 35 feet, all other factors being equal. A uh, height of 120 or even higher will provide even more advantages. Uh, let me get down here. Uh, 120 will provide the effect of approximately eight to 10 times more transmitting power than the same antenna at 35 feet. So that's 120 compared to 35 feet. Uh, obviously not the same difference we're talking about there, but uh, it goes to what Brian was saying, the exponential difference. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that this isn't always just 50 to 65. If I could call up that photo, typical installation doesn't necessarily just have doesn't just have a, the beam antenna at the very top of the facility in and a very common uh, uh, arrangement uh, such as was in that uh, photo although there were two beams in that photo um, uh, oh either one or two let's go to so th this was the modified photo with the top, that white T is the top at 50 feet. Now what you have is, uh, you actually have two beam antennas mounted below that. Uh, in this case you have a horizontal VHF antenna on top, but more commonly, especially in an urban setting, would be to have one or two beams mounted somewhere down below the top, such as is done here, and then on top of that have a vertical VHF, UHF antenna that may range anywhere from 6 to 18 feet. Well, that 6 to 18 feet counts against the limit. So if 65 is the limit, that puts my beam at maybe 15 or 50 feet. If 50 feet is the limit, it puts my beam down at 35 feet. Uh, so it's not just that 15 from 50 to 65. It can be the 15 between 50 and 35, effectively, uh, for an installation. Uh, the other point I'd make is um, 65 uh, is an important figure in terms of the typical structures. Most of the crank-up structures um, and tubular crank-up structures, which are less visually uh, noticeable, uh, such as what Brian has, are, are actually, most of the commercially built structures of that nature are, and they are all commercially built, I should say, are uh, typically uh, 50 feet or more. So by the very nature of what's available, you know, the typical uh, facility is going to go over 50 feet or at least be capable of going over 50 feet. So the, the amateur is paying for that even if he can't crank it up all the way and use that. And also, as I pointed out earlier, the 50 feet height can result in um, uh, ineffective, inefficient, uh, counterproductive installations such as forcing the uh, amateur to mount the vertical antenna in the yard on the ground or near the ground instead of on the roof line that the 65 feet would accommodate. Thanks. Any questions? Mark? Well, no, that's good. I just have one question for Lori. Is that? Yeah, that's fine. You got the floor. So, Lori, could you address the point that, that, if I heard this correctly, the city basically has no capacity for emergency communications if there is a big earthquake? The city, the city government itself, is that, is that the case? Uh, no, <laughs> I that's don't think case. so. Um, okay, so can you well, we're in transition, that? and we're definitely in transition. We just are setting up a new... Uh, as Mr. Grinnell mentioned, setting up a new organization with our surrounding communities, and presumably at some point uh, this group, which has worked very effectively with the city, will join with uh, that group. So um, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not, um, this is sort of a tangential question, but we're in the middle of a transition in emergency management, and we will have some sort of communications uh, aspect to that. Uh, and I, uh, again, I think it's important that I point out that we're talking about two different kinds of antennas here. The ones that are used in local emergency and public service tasks are the UHF, VHF antennas. Those are generally 15 to 20 feet in height. So if you were to place those on a rooftop, that would be between 50 and 55 feet in height on a 
foot tall house. What we're talking about with these higher heights uh, are HF antennas, which are really for regional purposes. You heard them talk about the Midwest, the East Coast, Antarctica. These are very far-ranging antennas and would be important in a large regional event where local communications are not going to be operating. So yes, there is a role for HF antennas, and it sounds like we have one in Kenmore uh, that we're aware of at Mr. Wingert's house. Um, but there is a distinction between those two types of antennas. Uh, there also can be HF antennas, my understanding is, that are on the ground that go up to about 43 feet tall. So that also influenced uh, my thinking in terms of the 50 foot height limit. I totally understand that these are very important. I totally understand that. And I think um, if it weren't a fee question, we might be having an easier discussion about at what point a tall antenna in someone's backyard should be subject to a conditional use permit review. Commissioner Olson? I'm assuming you're... I'm, I'm done. Okay. My, my question is a little different. It's, I, I would like to know more about the guidelines that are often attached, or are they now no longer attached to these tall ta antennas? Um, certain types of antennas, vertical antennas typically may have guidelines attached. Uh, the uh, the Rhone type tower, if you review the photos uh, that we sent out, uh, the Rhone type tower, which has uh, uniform parallel uh, supports as opposed to the crane trap, which is nested, uh, the Rome type takes, uh, requires uh, guidelines at uh, various levels, depending on how, how high you go. And, uh, of course, the higher, the, the taller the tower, those guidelines have to come out of a certain angle, so they require greater uh, yard size. Um, but yes, the crane trap towers are, are uh, very popular, as you can see here. This one is self-standing, and it is a 72-foot model. They make even ones that are self-standing. They cost more uh, to purchase, but they have the advantage not only in, in terms of uh, being unguided, the capability to be, to be unguided, but because they can be brought down, they make it a lot easier and safer for maintenance to be performed on the, on the antenna. So they are increasingly popular. Uh, I, I think Brian could probably speak to the relative prevalence of the two. Yes, I would appreciate that. I know one guy with a guide tower, everybody else has uh, just crank ups. They're just, they're a cleaner look. Uh, they're actually safer around here. Um, it's windstorms, trees fall over. If you've got a bunch of guys supporting your tower, you've got a large area that can be hit with, with the crank up. They have to hit the tower. Um, Plus, you can crank the tower down. Almost like that. Um, one of my buddies has a, has a guide tower, everybody else has a uh, crank up, freestanding crank up. Just, that's a better design. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. I had a question for, for you, Lori. I know we're struggling with this permit issue um, in terms of the cost. Is, and it seems like even from what you said and what I kind of feel in my gut that the main issue is that neighbors would have a problem with this. I mean, it's, that's the issue, um, potentially that neighbors would have a problem. Um, and so is there a way when something is just simply permitted that neighbors can have input or does that have to be through a conditional use permit? Well, in the current telecommunications chapter, for example, uh, neighbors have to be notified in some cases and there has to be a public meeting held uh, and alternatives considered, it's, it's, it's different for a ham operator because there really aren't any alternatives. They need to have it at their house, uh, generally. Okay. Um, okay. So that's one example where there may not be a permit required, but there's a community meeting required. To set up a, um, a public meeting without criteria for approving a permit is slightly problematic yeah. um, because 
you have a decision maker or either it's outright permitted and you just are going to have a community meeting to let people know or if you want to have a community meeting and have some feedback to, to someone you need a decision maker which leads you to a process right. so it doesn't work very well anything else no any other questions so I wanted to raise a couple of points as I'm thinking about this. And this is all part of the discussion of the pending motion. We're going to vote on the motion after discussions ended on this. And I'll, I'd like uh, Lori to read the motion again so it refreshes our memories before we vote on it. All right. I'm sorry? I, I, <laughs> I will okay try to do that. I think it's in the minutes. I hope it's I'll in the minutes. Time. If you need it, take it. We'll give you a recess if we have to. But <laughs> I'm looking at the other cities, jurisdictions around us. We're currently exempt for these ham antenna, right? No permit, unlimited height. We've got one HF antenna. Not a lot. There are a couple other jurisdictions that exempt any standards for these antenna. The FCC puts a lot of emphasis and, and value on the public safety benefits from these antenna and these operators. They've got a, it sounds like, a very good history of operating this, their services for a long time, even though some have been phased out, understandably, for governmental financial constraints. Now we're talking about, the staff is recommending what seem to be the most restrictive height limits of any jurisdiction in this area. And during his comments, Brian said, we've had these antenna, they presented no problem, <clears throat> and now you're imposing very strict limitations on us. And that struck me rather significantly. You know, I think everybody has a very legitimate concern about protecting views because of the topography we have here in Kenmore, the value of that lake in particular, you know, the value it gives this community, the potential it creates for us. We've dealt with it so many times with so many different issues, and I think very well for the most part. But to go from exempt to the most restrictive height limits of any jurisdiction in this area, given their history and given the very limited number of these antenna, I'm uncomfortable with the staff recommendation at this point. What I'm kind of thinking about is to let them go to 65, and I'll tell you the jurisdiction I think that's the most specific and still protects the aesthetic value of allowing that is red. And they've got five criteria here. For, for antenna that go up to that height, well, at least four, because one of them refers to just lower antenna. But only allow that for residential zones on our use table are the first two columns. Those are the residential zones, R1 through R24. The commercial zones will still have lower height limits. Those are areas that are down near the waterfront where much higher antenna would obstruct the views that we've been trying and successfully protected for a long time. So that's where I'm leaning, and that's, those are the reasons why. Anybody else? Do you want to respond, Lori? I was just going to say that the motion, uh, Commissioner Baker made a motion to accept the staff recommendations as they stand, although I think you all uh, were talking about adjusting them in one uh, in the view area, and the motion was seconded by Commissioner Vanderlund. Uh, I think the only, only comment I would make is that I think the commission has done a, um, a good job of protecting view issues in the view areas. And I, I want to be clear that if a 65 foot height limit with an outright permitted height limit of 65 feet is put in place in the city's residential zones, there could be, there have not historically been, but there could be view issues and significant view issues. So I, I, I want you all to just be aware of that. Right, but the, and I appreciate that. And it's a good point. And I, I know it addresses a lot of concerns, including mine. But what we're really discussing is the difference between 50 and 65. Right. You're gonna be neighbors complaining about 50. So the question is, does the extra 15 feet, for the benefit it would provide these ham operators, create that many more issues potentially for residential zone? Uh, citizens. Go I mean, ahead, Deborah. I, I actually think it'd be less, I mean, given what we've seen. Yeah. 
It's less issues. I, I don't have any problem with going with 65. I think the issue between 50 and 65 is kind of a non-issue, but it, it's the, the, whether it's 50 or 65, if it's in a view corridor, I mean, it, it's, that seems yeah. to be the, the, the issue. And I, I just, I keep kind of wrapping my head back to, well, can't we just consider whether it's in a view corridor, whether it's residential or commercial, and I don't know. I don't know how we do that without a conditional use permit. I mean, so we, we keep going in this circle, and I don't know how to get out of it. <laughs> Sorry. Right. No, I appreciate you bringing that up. Anybody else? Go ahead, Mike. The existing legislation that we have today around the exemption for ham radio operators seems to have resulted in one VHF UHF antenna in our community, and um, I don't see where changing it is going to impact that or leaving the exemption in place is necessarily going to change that. The gentlemen that have spoke to us over the past several weeks seem very uh, knowledgeable and uh, responsible, and, and, and I think this community of ham operators is, is balancing the needs of their special interest with the needs of the community and I'm comfortable personally with an exemption as it stands and that some of our neighboring communities have left in place like Kirkland. Um, I appreciate that 65 feet seems to be a reasonable compromise but um, I'm also very comfortable with the idea of leaving the exemption in place. Thanks Mike. Uh, Deborah, your point. Uh, I want to take that up a little. Can we not have, can we include as part of the criteria for having 65 feet? And Redmond's got numerous criteria. And if we were to adopt a Redmond like criteria for residential zones, could not we include obstruction of views of Lake Washington, which I know is subjective, but it would save $4,000 if they're not. Obstruct, clearly not obstructing a view. If there were some degree of obstruction, then somebody could challenge it or the city could reject it, and then they could take up that specific issue. So I, I think it may address Deborah's concern if we made that an additional criteria, because what I'm proposing already has criteria that the antenna have to satisfy, including those for aesthetic purposes, like uh, paint colors and screening. So I. It, with deference and, and respect for Deborah's point, I would like to add that to the Redmond criteria. That uh, certainly um, is possible. So the, if the commission wants to pursue that, then the question is, at what point do you want a conditional use permit? Do uh, Redmond, as you know, says that a process is required if it doesn't meet the standards that are outlined? So if you added a standard that it can't block views and staff's conclusion was that it, it did block views, then they'd have to move to the conditional use permit process. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Anyway, those are my comments. It, it, it's why I would vote against this motion, but that's all I could do at this point because of the posture right now of the motion. Is there any more discussion on this motion? Not your motion, but the motion on the table. Exactly, the motion on the table. We have to dispose of that first, and then, yeah. you know, I've made my comments, Deborah's made hers, so there's obviously thought of given to another motion after this. If it failed, please go ahead, Deb, uh, well, I, Baker. I think in light of the new information we've been gathering and the history of how the 50-foot limit got decided. Uh, I think we should vote on this motion on the table and it more than likely will fail. And then we can create a new motion that will move us forward with the real goals that we want to accomplish. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other comment before we vote? All right. Discussion having been satisfied. All in favor of the motion. If anybody wants it reread, we could do it. Are you comfortable with what we've heard? Could you we understand one more, one more time. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Baker made a motion to accept the staff recommendations as a stand, and the motion was seconded by Commissioner Vanderland. Okay. All in favor of Commissioner Baker's motion, raise your hand and say aye. 
All opposed, raise your hand and say nay. 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 Any abstentions? None. Therefore, the motion fails. That's good. All right, do I hear a, another motion on this issue? <laughs> All right, here's what I'm going to throw out. Uh, I move that the commission adopt a ham antenna standard that reflects those specified in the Redmond example in the staff's memo dated January 26, 2016, with the inclusion of an additional criteria that the antenna not obstruct views of Lake Washington, and that that criteria apply to uh, antenna in the first two columns of the, what do we call it, the use table at the end of that memo, and those first two columns are for residential zones R1 through R6 and residential zones R12 through R24, and that the other columns would stay as the staff prepared them. Do I hear a second? Second. <laughs> Discussion. <coughs> Go ahead, Mike. So the last sentence that you added there, the other columns, this, is, this is only about ham radio. Right, right. only ham radio. radio. Got it. So these, these areas that are non-residential, Could I make one clarification? Please. So the Redmond standards set out a 65-foot height limit for ground-mounted facilities, but a 25-foot height limit for roof-mounted facilities. Is that Getting what you had 60, intended? 60. Right. Good point. So do we need to get well, we're at 60 if it's a roof-mounted antenna, not 65. And the ham operator citizens, Brian and Robert, have said we want 65. So there'd be an argument for doing a 60-foot. And I'm okay with that. So what, thank 60? you for that point. A 30-foot antenna for roof-mounted facilities. So it could go up to yeah. 65. I think it should be consistent. Robert, do you want to comment on that? That would actually be a problem for the specific case I presented. That's a 28-foot antenna. Those types of roof-mounted antennas typically go up to that range, about 30 feet. So, right. so 30 five, works. Right. What's that? 30 foot limit works. Right. 30, roof mounted. Not 25, right? Yeah, that's what I'm yes. saying. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. I, I, no, we're trying we're to going your direction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard 60, and that was 30. Yeah, that's why we, and, and to Lori's credit, she brought up that point. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to get yeah. consistent. Thank you, Lori. Uh -huh. Michael, please. Uh, two questions. One, I, at some point, I'd like to hear you read back what the Redmond exclusion criteria are. Yes. Uh, and also, in the uh, version of the table I'm looking at, uh, I see to be determined in the third and fifth. Sixth box. Right. There were two memos. Uh, the 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 chart uh, that we're looking at right now is uh, the memo. It was the first memo titled "Communication Facilities Ham Radio Update," and on page three of that memo is the chart related to ham radio review processes. Thank you. So those are the three columns. Yeah. And I think what uh, Doug's motion was that the first two columns, the staff recommendation would be replaced with um, the Redmond standards. And those standards are uh, relating to paint colors and screening, that they're not allowed in setbacks and must be located as far as possible from lot lines and residential structures on neighboring lots. A 30 foot height limit for roof-mounted facilities, that's a change, but that's the one you just discussed. And then a 65-foot height limit for ground-mounted facilities, plus inclusion of criteria about not obstructing views of Lake Washington. With And then uh, the other caveat there is that if the proposed uh, facility did not meet these standards, then it would be a conditional use permit. Exactly. So I've revised my motion accordingly, and I'm looking at Commissioner Srebnik, and it looks like she's willing to second the same version of it. So that, that's the motion. Commissioner Orange, Vice Chair. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify. The view obstruction, is that from anywhere? Is that from a neighboring property? Is that from the street? Is that from 
a hillside? What, how, how do you define view obstruction? Good question. Because um, that, I think, might... We define it different ways but. in uh, the code. Okay. In some cases, it's from the public right-of-way, uh, including, for example, from SR-522 when we were talking about between the public right-of-way and the street. Uh, in the community business zone, views were assessed from the public right-of-way. Um, but it's undefined. I mean, we would... Is there no standard for the residential zones that we're talking about then? No. So uh, it would be a matter of defining Yeah, and my a thought is, and this is what we've protected throughout in previous zoning issues and height limit issues, and that is views of Lake Washington from the public right-of-way or private property. But that would be everything. That's everything. <laughs> what is that yeah, that's everything. So why would you? <laughs> that's only on land. That what about if except you're, for what yeah, if you're right. in a, like a helicopter? What about, yeah. What if you're driving? I'm living in a drone. <laughs> a drone. Yeah. Right. So yeah, there, there need you know that's the I, I, my thought is the broadest possible view protection. I, I'm you thinking. Have. I, I agree with that approach. I and I think the only exception would be for non-buildable lots. I suppose you could do that, but. So there wouldn't be somebody occupying that, or potentially occupying that property, or enjoying a view from it. Right. So do we have to define that in this, or is that? You? We would have to define it, but I'm I remember where we are in this process. Where next step is to draft the regulations, and if you all tell me that you want the, a broad interpretation of view, then when I write the draft, I'll include that. I, I would. Some language, and if you don't like it, we'll change it. Mr. Vanderlyn. I like everything we said. Question, though, uh, is there any kind of public notice that goes out if someone, I'm assuming they're going to apply for a permit to do this, it falls within our exceptions, but we, I'm looking for an opportunity for a neighbor to be able to say, yeah, this obstructs my view or if I can get comment well, on well, it. Well, again, it gets back to usually if, it's a, if something is permitted, like a building permit, we don't kind of let, send out a notice to the neighbors going, guess what, your neighbor's building a deck. So it's, if it's something which is outright permitted, it's usually outright permitted without neighbor notification. Only gets into neighbor notification if you're in sort of a, a higher kind of process. Like a conditional use that, permit. Okay, so that wouldn't happen. So it would be up it to the not. director to to make that judgment about whether this was obstructing the view. Yeah. Yeah, the person who's going to be most interested in protecting the view is the neighbor who doesn't know that it's going up at the time the permit is submitted. That's. No. I think that's your that's point, and that's what I, I think it's a good one. Yeah, but we we don't know if they won't know the view issue as well as the neighbors. I, the the difficulty, of course, as is always a difficulty with views, is that uh, the person who is reviewing the permit is likely to go out to the property and maybe drive in the immediate vicinity, but not realize that the person up a few streets up on the hill is now going to face this challenge. So it's not going to be a perfect system, but I think you know the effort will certainly be made. So Mike, you know, we could have another more specific when we get to that code writing phase, language about sending notice to neighbor uh, property owners within X hundred feet or something. I think something like that would be ideal. I don't know that it's doable, but you know, I think couple things first of all it's that neighbor what you're not they're not you're right you're not going to know what the impact is unless you survey the people give a possibility to answer it but at the same time does it create any liability for the city or, or a disgruntled neighbor to come back oh. and, and claim that you didn't follow the rules or you, you you didn't apply the right standard in determining whether or not it was a view obstruction or whatnot And the answer is? I, I, I may be painting the horrible, worst, some of all fear scenario, but well, it's nice I, to know the answer to those things before we go. Right. Go I, I will tell you that the staff recommendation is for a permit process to get public input on a tall tower. <laughs> 
Um, that is the purpose of the recommendation. If you don't want a permit process, then it's all workarounds as to how to let people know that this might be happening, and even if they know, what is the recourse? It's not a public hearing. It's not an opportunity formally for public comment. They certainly can express their concerns to the decision maker, but they don't have a role in the approval. And, and typically for something like a, like a building permit level, there's no administrative appeal. It would be an appeal directly to Superior Court. Which actually isn't such a bad thing, yeah. <laughs> because you have way more latitude in a Superior Court hearing than you do in a uh, hearing examiner. Commissioner Srebnik, did you have another response? Yeah, I mean, they, I think they've made it abundantly clear that if it's, you know, permitted, that they're not going to notify the neighbors. I mean, to me, though, the issue of, you know, if you're going to notify the neighbors, you may as well notify them at 35 feet. You know, I mean, it, it's just, no, you know, no, anything, no, no. Above, anything above the standard height of houses is going to be an impact if it's in somebody's face. So, yeah, but I, you know, that's the problem. So I think if we, as long as we have that criteria in there and we trust our staff at some level, um, you know, I, I guess I'm good with that. Well, just because a neighbor doesn't like it doesn't mean they have legal standing or they can interfere with the process. If there's this criteria and it's yeah, that's obstructing I mean. their view and then the neighbor consults the standards and says, hey, they're giving out a permit or somebody's applied for a permit and it obstructs my view, but they're not taking that into account. I'm trying to get that, that point in the criteria the neighbors have a chance to exercise their point, their position on that. I, I don't, I don't know that I've heard that we can. I asked for that earlier, and it sounded like that, because as soon as you do that, that triggers this, essentially a dialogue, which um, between the city and the public, which is implies a process that doesn't mm -hmm. exist unless you have a conditional use permit. So I mean, that's that's why I raised that earlier. Michael. So I think. In my mind, what this comes down to is we have, an, we have a choice here. There's a trade-off. It's between the flexibility for the ham radio operators and what they can do versus a potential but unknowable uh, disadvantage to a neighbor. And that's where I think this decision lies. I've, you know, I'm still okay with this amendment. We, we've done other things in the past where we said, well, I guess we have to trust the staff on this. And I've been okay with that in the past. Uh, as long as we do it with an open eye. Yeah, I agree. And and the other thing is they, the the neighbor I think does have recourse in Superior Court if it's wrongfully issued. And it's a risk that the city would take because they would be the defendant in that action. It would only hopefully give the staff more sensitivity to trying to get that subjective viewpoint, a criterion right, so that they don't expose the city to having to defend a, a, a lawsuit. So I'm perfectly comfortable just leaving you know yep. leaving the staff at risk here. At, yeah. Washing ourselves of any yeah, responsibility right. beyond this point. That works fine with me. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Anybody? Um, Commissioner Mulcair? Yeah, in terms of the language around view protection that we just discussed and uh, to a lesser degree the height restriction, our citizen comments around the crank up technology. Um, has me wondering if there's a difference between a permanent installation, in other words, an antenna that's always there and always visible, and one that's cranked up during the time you wish to operate your radio. And if we're differentiating, is, is, blue, is view blockage a binary situation? If you crank up your mast and the view is blocked, well, that's a view blocking antenna, or if you were to crank up your antenna between the hours of yes. what time do you guys operate? 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Well, uh, <laughs> um, any, any time of day, but uh, I, yeah, I did make a comment last time that uh, if this is mostly an after-work activity, I'm assuming we all work during the day. Some some operate during the day, and there are different advantages at different times of the year. Uh, some, uh, at least one uh, uh, city that we have the example regulations from. Uh, the heights were much higher, but they allowed, I think, up to 110 feet or 100 feet if the uh, tower was capable of being lowered to 70 or 80 feet, for example. I can dig that out if you want. 
I remember so that conversation we had. That's a possibility too, to allow us a greater height and, and maybe stipulate when in use. Uh, well, the crank up thing's kind of interesting. Um, they, they tend to be permanent because, see, the concrete base that you pour is, you know, 12 by 12 by 12, it's huge, three trucks of concrete. But do you leave your antenna up when you're not uh, using your radio? Raise and lowered. Um, I know of uh, instances where people are uh, bought newer homes and they're in CCNR communities where they can't have um, ham radio towers. So the first thing you do is volunteer for the board. And after there a few years, you find yourself with an exemption where they, they let you put one in and you can you know, crank it up, on, like say from one to five Saturday afternoon or something. Uh, a friend of mine that uh, did that, he's uh, uh, big in contesting. It's a weekend activity. And the contests, the big ones go from Friday night to Sunday night, but there's a whole bunch that are like you know, Saturday only. And they let him uh, crank it up 12 times a year. Once a month, he gets to, you know, one week in a month, they let him crank his tower up. So uh, that's certainly um, doable. It certainly, maybe there's some kind of balance to be struck with, uh, you know, view properties. Um, are know, these sorry, mechanically sorry, cranked or ele maybe. electric crank? What's that? Are these me mechanically cranked, or are these on a, an electric motor? They can be either. Yeah, most of the big ones are, are powered. They're you know electric winches. Uh, mine is slow tech. I got a hand winch on it, but it's you know it's not a big tower. Okay, thanks. Vice Chair, <laughs> so I, what do your neighbors say now about the, your your ham towers? I mean, do you do you honestly do you get much pushback from them in terms of I don't you know you, comment? You you've never had a comment. It's been up uh, well, 15 or 16 years now, and um, there was one weekend. Consumer devices are Part 15 devices, according to the FCC. Um, they're not supposed to interfere with licensed uh, radio services, which includes you know, police, fire, ham radio, aircraft. And they're supposed to accept interference from licensed radio services. Anyway, uh, my neighbor, the worst consumer devices are uh, speakers, those little plug-in speakers for your PC. You, you plug that in the middle, and you put one over here, you want over here, and they're eight feet, um, you know, about eight, eight to ten feet long. Perfect antenna for about three of the ham dams. And so, if there's a ham radio operator in your neighborhood, and they point their antenna at that, um, it's going to receive some noise. So one of my neighbors on one side, during a football game, they were streaming their football game instead of watching on TV. They said, were you transmitting, you know, Sunday afternoon? Uh-huh. That was it. That was one question in 15 years. Um, no one's complained. No one said boo. Okay. But we're, you know, we're at the top of it up, too. We're not obstructing like Washington. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Anything else? Are we ready to vote? Okay. I think we all know what the motion says, but we can have Lori rephrase it if we want. Anybody? We're comfortable with it? The language? Amendments? Lori, you understand what, what's on totally the table? I totally have it. All right. <laughs> so all in favor of the motion, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All opposed, raise your hand and say nay. Any abstention? Motion carries. So I think we have uh, the remaining issues that you came in the next memo to d address. Is that right? That's correct. That Ken had addressed also in his mm -hmm. citizen comment. So we don't have a motion on the table for that. Is that right? That's correct. We haven't even talked about some of these issues. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Unless Mike, you want just one. I just want to make sure on the previous topic we don't mm -hmm. lose the question about a reduced fee. You, uh, I think you had a question about going back whether or not was, that was legal. Uh, I had checked with the city attorney, and that that was a discussion about you had to um, justify a reduced fee either because it took less time or uh, because there was a dedicated contractual public service provided. And uh, it certainly wouldn't take 
less time, we're talking about more limited circumstances now when a conditional use permit would be required to be over 65 feet or over 30 feet on a roof mounted installation. It wouldn't meet some of those other requirements. So it's different from what we were initially talking about. Um, the question of whether a contractual public service could be provided, I think uh, Mr. Grinnell indicated that there was a problem there uh, because of the FCC rules that they're amateur. Uh, radio operators. So I think where we are is that there is not a convenient or um, supportable way to reduce the fee just for a ham radio operator conditional use permit. Okay. All right. So next item, what should we call it? I know it's the next memo. Right. It is the next memo. These are the remaining policy issues uh, that we identified many months ago. Uh, and, and so these are the last ones uh, to be discussed. So the first one, and I, I think I can just, if you'd like, I'll just summarize what the topic is and what the staff recommendation is, and then you can have your discussion, ask questions, that kind of thing. So the first issue is treatment of communication facilities in the right-of-way. So these, the right-of-way, of course, street right-of-way. Um, there are currently two uh, places where these standards appear. One is in a section of the Municipal Code, uh, Chapter 12.58, and then there are standards in the existing chapter that we're looking at, Chapter 1860. And these um, standards conflict uh, in some areas. This is, again, one of those consistency problems that prompted the whole revisiting of these rules. So staff is recommending that all of the development standards, all the standards that relate to height and location of equipment and screening and that kind of thing be in the zoning code, uh, even though the facilities may be in the right of way, and that chapter 12.58 only talk about the process of approving uh, those permits so that um, the city has uh, review processes that have to do with the control of their own right of way, and that's what would remain in, in Chapter 1258. Any comment? Any objection? None? Okay. So uh, some of the development standards were also a topic under this policy issue. So there are certainly existing standards. They have. Do you, are, are you comfortable with the concept of flush mounting? Does that make sense? That what you're trying to do is to get the antennas as close to the center of the pole as you can so that there aren't great big arms out there. So current standards require flush mounting. Uh, and if the antennas aren't flush mounted on the side of the pole, then they're supposed to be centered on the top of the pole uh, and camouflaged or disguised. And then the equipment cabinets are supposed to be underground if they're within a certain distance of um, residences. So staff recommends keeping those current, those are current requirements. Staff recommends keeping those uh, current requirements, but adding in a standard uh, that came from the city of Kirkland that has to do with uh, how cabling and conduit, um, the running of conduit should happen to avoid cases where a normal size wooden utility pole is replaced with a pole of gigantic diameter uh, and greater height to um, include the conduit and cabling and that kind of thing. Kirkland, I know for a fact, wrote this rule because of a very large and very unsightly tower that was put in their community. And so this standard was directly <laughs> taken from that experience. So uh, basically it says, cable and conduit should be routed through the inside of the pole where this is not feasible or where routing would result in a structure of substantially different design or substantially greater diameter than that of similar structures in the vicinity, the city may allow or require that the cable or conduit be placed on the outside of the structure. It has to be the color of the utility pole or other support structure. Uh, and it may be required, the, the cabling may need to be in conduit. So in a nutshell, 
what happened was they had a requirement that the cabling be put in the pole. The cabling couldn't be put in the pole, so instead a great new, big new giant pole was used to put the cabling inside. They're going, oh, that was a mistake. We should have let the cabling be on the outside. Any comment? Any objection? None? Okay. All right. So the next uh, policy issue has to do with visual compatibility uh, techniques. And the existing chapter in the zoning code already addresses setbacks, uh, color standards, uh, some visual compatibility standards, and flush mounting. And uh, so staff is recommending retaining all of the existing standards, but then adding some new standards relating to minimizing view blockage. Um, and so that will interrelate with some of the decisions you've just made uh, about view zones and that kind of thing. Uh, a standard that aluminum mesh rather than fiberglass satellite dishes be used. And I, I have a photograph if that would be helpful. But um, mesh satellite dishes are much less visually intrusive. And some jurisdictions have requested that instead of the fiberglass dishes. Uh, the third um, visual compatibility technique that would be new would be an emphasis on stealth technology. And um, I think uh, Ken Lyons had indicated that it's much more sophisticated now. That's great. And we don't really have language that specifically addresses that, but I think that would be a good thing. Uh, the placing of the equipment cabinets underground if practical and a prohibition against signage. We don't have a prohibition against signage. I haven't seen signage on our um, towers, for example, but I think it should be explicit that, that you cannot put signage, commercial signage. Certainly you have safety signage and that kind of thing, but this would be commercial signage on a tower. Comment? Yes. I just have a, a little one. Um, it looks like um, in our 1860-250, there's a, it just says landscaping requirements. Mm -hmm. Is there any more specificity on that? Because some of the others, you know, say you know trees as a backdrop or something. I mean, they're they're a little more descriptive of what what that means. So. Let me look at 1862.50. We certainly have requirements for landscaping around equipment cabinets and okay. that kind of thing. We, we do. I, well, uh -huh. I mean, what, what you put in the memo just says landscaping requirements, so I, oh, okay. I didn't actually right. go we back. We have to um, uh, landscaping requirements around the outside of an equipment cabinet location. There are fencing standards and uh, uh, buffering landscaping requirements. Yes. Vice Chair. Um, I liked uh, the Kirkland's first one about a tower in a more open setting shall have a backdrop. Do, do any of our requirements cover that? I noticed that wasn't included in the list of um, your recommendations. Right. Is I, that already covered or, or, or something it, like that? It's it not covered, covered exactly. Um, I think we could, we could look at a rule like that. It's, I guess that one in particular seemed a little bit vague to me, but one thing, maybe, I don't know, a park or an athletic, I don't know, what, what, what would be a more open setting? I mean, it, <laughs> so, so we don't have a tower in the middle of, you know, some large open setting. Um, uh, so more placed back where? Um, it just, yeah, I just, I just like the way the Kirkland one reads on that point. Uh, okay. I, I, Yeah, if I, I, I agree with the vice chair's points on that. Okay, does the rest of the commission like that standard and I can pull it forward? Yes, he has. Three? Okay. Do we have? Any objection to that? None? Okay. Next. Any other questions on that one or? No objections on the other staff recommendations on that point? None? Okay. Okay. 
All right, so the next few sections deal with uh, modifications to communication facilities. And I've broken this out into three different types of modifications to facilities. The first type of a modification uh, Ken Lyons referenced, which um, are modifications that respond to a 2014 FCC rule that said that the city um, cannot deny modifications that are not um, significant. And then they went on to define what those um, substantial uh, change, what a substantial change is, and if it was not substantial, then you can do it, basically. The city has to approve it, and we have a time limit within which we can approve it. So those standards, um, they're kind of complex, but they're on page five of your memo. And basically what it's saying is that you can increase the height and you can increase how far out from the pole the antennas can be. Uh, you can install a certain number of new equipment cabinets, um, but you can't excavate or deploy equipment outside the current site. Uh, and if you have concealment elements to your tower, you can't do something that would defeat those elements. And you can't go against the conditions that originally approved your um, uh, intent, your facility. I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail with this because it's not optional. This is a requirement, okay? So the standards that I am proposing would be written right off of uh, the FCC requirements. Uh, we are calling them ECFMs, Eligible Communication Facility Modifications. So there would be a section in the code that addressed these FCC requirements uh, pretty much verbatim. The second type of modification would be uh, a modif modifications that did not meet the ECFM standards. For example, they wanted to do a modification that was taller than you can do under an ECFM. Uh, you wanted more height than 10 or 20 feet or um, some other kind of a modification. You wanted more equipment cabinets, that kind of thing. Those modifications to conforming facilities, so in other words, facilities that were approved and uh, meet the current standards for conforming facilities, I would hope to set in place a process that made uh, that easier um, because we want co-location if possible. So I would not anticipate setting out a set of rigorous standards for modifications to conforming facilities. The third type of modification is to non-conforming facilities. So those are facilities that don't meet our current standards, that don't fall under the ECFM um, criteria, but uh, would be a modification to a non-conforming facility. And I would anticipate with those that uh, we would not be as accepting. <laughs> Certainly we wouldn't want to say you could outright replace or rebuild one of those towers. That should go through the process, the current uh, process. Um, but if there were other kinds of changes requested, then we would only allow those modifications if they met our visual compatibility standards and if they were reviewed through a conditional use permit process so that we could really look at for a non-conforming facility, this is one that doesn't meet our standards, where it was, what the, uh, what the um, issues were. Comment? Commissioner Srebnik? Sorry, I have a lot of comments. Okay, good. <laughs> I mean, just tonight in general. Um, so in the first case, which is you have a conforming, mm -hmm. origin, you know, conforming structure that they're wanting to modify. Correct. I think that makes sense to, you know, not have that be rigorous or much at all if, if the modification still results in a conforming. Right. Okay, but you didn't, we, you we didn't wouldn't, exactly say that. Yeah, we but. would not allow 
a modification that didn't meet our current standards. Standards, right? Okay, so just right. wanted to underscore that. Okay, right. and then in the second case where you're starting with a non-conforming <laughs> and you wanted to modify that, um, I, th I would think we might actually want to incentivize that if it resulted in a conforming um, structure facility, right? Wouldn't we want them to modify it to make it good <laughs> or replace it? I, I think you can think about it in a couple of ways. If they were taking down the tower and replacing it, yeah. yes, we certainly would want it to be conforming. And that's why I'm saying that those kinds of modifications should not be allowed. The kinds of modifications that we might see uh, to a non-conforming structure would be antennas. And, you know, there's some question here whether the modifications that would be requested would fall under this ECFM process or not. So we're kind of thinking like we're covering all the bases here. But if someone wanted to do a modification to a non-conforming tower, even if they flush mounted it, for example, if it were in the wrong location, we might not be okay with more antennas on it. Even though it met our current standards, it might be in the wrong place. Um, so would we want to allow it to be bigger? So you're weighing the benefit of co-location with a potential problem. Does, does that make sense? So Ken had his hand up, and I'm, I mean, we kind of agreed that we're open, the floor is open to any commissioner who wants to enable this. Ken or somebody else to re respond, but that's up to you. You have the floor. <laughs> Does anybody want to hear from Ken? Sure. Uh, I'll, I would. Oops. Good. All we need is one. We got okay. One. Please, please make a comment. Ken, if, okay. and, and to the mic so that it gets recorded and people who are watching, the thousands of people who are probably watching sure. on, the, on their live smartphones, stream video. I might add, right? <laughs> on their smartphones. <laughs> Uh, I would respectfully um, request that the city take a very good look at the FCC rule. It explicitly applies to both conforming facilities and non -conform legal non-conforming facilities, regardless of their status. If they were legitimately permitted at one time, then they are required to, they, they are allowed to be modified under that particular section. The second thing I would point out is that once this new code passes, there will not be a single site in the city, at least AT&T facility, I won't speak for everyone since I don't know every single site in the city, uh, that will not, that, that will be conforming. They will all be non-conforming as a result of height limits and things that, uh, that are proposed in, in this uh, particular ordinance. So, anyway. Uh, you want to respond? Lauren? Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond that I know that the ECFM process re applies both to conforming and non-conforming facilities. We're trying to set out standards outside of the ECFM process in case there are modifications requested that don't fall under the ECFM process. And that's helpful. It's just I noted in, in your comments that the SEC standards you, you said to conforming facilities, and I was just pointing out that it, it applies, applies to conforming to or yeah. non-conforming. It doesn't matter so long as it was legitimately permitted at one time. Right. So. And the other point you made, Ken, was that you're saying all existing facilities would now become non-conforming if the city adopted these standards. You're saying none of the current facilities conform to what the city is now proposing. I would. I, I wasn't speaking for everybody's facilities. I'll, but I'll speak all for of ours. AT &T's, you know, a a question way is in which they don't conform. Yeah, for height. height. Oh, height. So, which means essentially those sites would have to think about this. If if a site essentially cannot let's let's say the structural capacity of a tower has reached a point where it cannot physically support uh, more equipment. Um, basically, it would have to be re-permitted, and it would have to go through your process. In many cases, it may not even be allowed in the zone anymore. It may not even be permittable um, uh, because of, you can't get a variance for use, in which case you're having to break that site and force, essentially, disruption in service to be able to replace the uh, utility of that service to the people that are currently receiving it. So. Yeah, but that's why we put all those protections in place. Was to you know, there's some that are currently obstructing views, perhaps, and, and our goal, and that's with any change in zoning, is to get to the point where we have our current zoning, mm -hmm. to provide the protections that are behind that that change. So, I see where you're coming from, but that's that meets the the public versus your private conflict, and that's where we had drawn that line. 
Mm -hmm. and we don't, we're a city who has a couple of huge assets and a lot of you know, other expenses that cities don't have. And mm -hmm. what you just, as I've said, is, and I think as the commission has, has corroborated, is Lake Washington. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly understandable. The question is whether or not, um, you know, it, it, it's not easy yeah. to build sites at all. And uh, particularly if every site to break, if you're taking a site that currently serves and you have to replace it with three sites that all have to go through condition use permit process, you know, and keep in mind, this is service that people depend on. Yep. You know, they depend on it. And so to the extent that there's a way of being able to look at alternative sites, that that's something that has to happen that doesn't have to go through the normal process, you know, it's difficult to, uh, to envision one of these sites really coming down. So. And the other side of that, and we talked about this at the last meeting, was you've got technology and time on your side. We don't. We give up some of the, the, the view protection that we have now. We may never get it back. You, on the other hand, the trend is in your favor of producing antenna and other transmission equipment that doesn't have to obstruct anything and still provide good service. Well, I, I think that there's been a lot of uh, a lot said uh, from uh, a lot of people back in the late 1990s or when I first started in wireless in the early 2000s. Thought we'd all have uh, satellite phones by now, you know, and we certainly do not, you know. And many of the sites that uh, we certainly have seen sites get smaller, but certainly not as small as to really uh, disobey the laws of physics when it comes to radio propagation. So there is a, it, there's a terminal how far you can really go before that happens. So, right. Yeah. So the, the, this is the gray area. We don't know how far you can get. We don't know how much we can protect and still provide full service. But if, if at least speaking for me, I'm erring, the doubt will, I'm erring on the side of view protection because that's the one that we know can't, we can't restore necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's up to the private property owner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Lori. I was just going to say, and Ken, you might uh, be, be able to speak to this, that when Carol was here last time, I think she indicated to us that she did not anticipate a request for lots of new cell towers, that sort of retrofitting was what they envisioned over the next eight to ten Years and I don't know if you have a different perspective, but that was what she had indicated. Yeah, well, I, I can say this: we um, we used to upgrade our sites about every five years, and uh, now we're upgrading. And then we were upgrading them every two years, and now we're upgrading them every year. And this year, in some cases in Kenmore, we're upgrading the sites twice in one year just to keep up with capacity. At some point, you know, we're maxing out the capacity of the sites that we have. And just new ones are going to have to be, you know, at some point you're just going to have to have um, additional capacity built. So I, I would anticipate and I would differ, and I'm not sure if, if that's what she meant. Certainly within the next 18 months, I would say we're pretty much focused on, on squeezing every single little bit of capacity out of the sites we have. But I would say certainly within the next 8 to 10 years, we probably would see construction of new facilities. They may not look the same, and there might be a variety uh, of types of facilities built, but certainly not. Um, not no new ones, you know. But Lori, doesn't AT and T still have the CUP option if they don't qualify under the current criteria? So um, I I think the point uh, that uh, Ken was making is that uh, for uh, and this is in the the chart, if for example they needed to develop a new tower or monopole, it is prohibited. Uh, as written in the residential zones. So no, he, there would not be a conditional use permit opportunity to consider locating that mm -hmm. in uh, the residential zones. And okay. I think that's the concern mm -hmm. yeah. that he expressed. Okay. Likewise, there, of course, in there the are other zones view zones. Where they are. Right. right, it would be the um, some of the non-residential zones. That are outside the view corridor. Right, correct. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other questions or comments? No? Any? Yes, Commissioner Vanderlei. Maybe bring us back to something we talked about earlier. We no way to predict what the technology is going to do over the next eight to ten years. One of the issues we talked about was decommissioning and who would be responsible financially for that. And I was intrigued by the language here at the bottom of page six and Redmond. Uh, permits may be conditioned to allow review of continued use of the antenna support structure at five-year intervals. 
in order to recognize that rapid technology advances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering if that's something we might want to consider or maybe staff has some information on right. decommissioning involved or what the flexibility Right. Is. So whenever we permit a new communication facility, there's a requirement that if it's no longer in use for some period of time, it has to be removed. So although we don't do a proactive review every five years, it's part of the permitting of the facility that if it's not if if the, and the applicant has to sign an awareness of this that they have to take it down if it's not going to be in use okay, so under the current rules the city could do that at any time correct what it's um, let me see situation. if I can give you the exact uh, it's uh, 1860 uh, 300 minor communication facilities cessation of use uh, so that there's a requirement that if, for example, an antenna is no longer operational, it has to be taken down. Um, and I, there may even be a bonding requirement related to that. Okay. Good point. Thank you. Anything else? Any objection to the staff recommendation? All right. Here's your direction. I, I want uh, just I wanted to bring up one other point and make sure you're comfortable with it for the ECFM. So these are the modifications that we have to approve right. uh, through the FCC ruling. Uh, those have to be approved within 60 days. And I don't know if this is possible, but there was some consideration at the staff level of whether if rather than uh, for example, go out six feet or, or 20 feet. Um, if, for example, a person wanting to do a quick review would do the flush mounting or meet our requirements, we might try to beat the clock. So rather than 60 days, we'd do it in 45. If, uh, so the trade-off is uh, we'd do it quicker, but they would meet our standards. I don't know that that's legal. We certainly, I don't think, could require it, but it might be an opportunity. There would be an incentive for them to meet our standards. Comment. So if you're interested in that, we'll have the city attorney look at it. Comment? So you're talking about some kind of expedited review? Yeah, in exchange right. for them complying with more requirements, but there, that I can see there being a legal challenge because FCC and preemption and things like that. But I like you thinking outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I think it's worth asking the city attorney. I agree. Okay. You know, okay. Ken, it's, it's, you can always ignore it. I mean, you're not, you're not burdened if they give you that option. Burdened, I'm sorry. Well, you, you have a chance of getting it. You only have to comply with this extra city requirement on top of E, whatever it is, ECFM. FCC requirements, if you want to get a faster permit review and response doesn't create a burden, it gives you an option of right. getting a faster permit. Right. So I don't see a, a downside, because you can always ignore it and still ignore the city's request. I, I don't think that certainly, you know, anything that would uh, uh, presume to say that the city can condition an approval uh, outside of what's allowed in the FCC rule. The FCC rule has been four corners of the document. And kind I, of a thing. I'm not challenging so that. I, I it's see a different process from. altogether. I'm just saying it doesn't, yeah. it wouldn't so. cost you anything if they did it. But if it's illegal, it's illegal. And that's up to the city attorney to, yeah. to decide. Yeah. Right. It wasn't the idea of imposing standards, it was right. an option, that's an my incentive. Point. That's my point. <laughs> it, it couldn't be done under the eligible facilities request. You'd have to create a separate. Process. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Anyway, I like Correct. the, the creative, creativity behind that. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Does that exhaust the? Uh, testing. 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 The last thing. We, we Thank did, you. We so um, the Telecommunications Act states that a local government may not regulate placement, construction, and modification of facilities on the basis of RF emissions. So this, these are the health-related concerns. And we've talked about this previously. Uh, the way. Uh, Kenmore currently checks that is that we have a variety of different statements signed by the electrical engineer or um, uh, other professional who says that we they meet the FCC standards and that's the way we guarantee that 
We, we don't have a safety issue because we're making sure they conform to the FCC standards. Every time a new antenna, for example, goes on a facility, that report has to be revisited. And so staff is recommending retaining the existing standards regarding these certifications. We really can't do our own regulation or put, our, put in our own standards, but we can ensure that, that um, the FCC standards are complied with, and that's the goal of the existing standards. Yeah, and I do remember talking about this, and I see here that you've noted San Rafael, California, requires a five-year review. And that's Correct. Regardless of modification. Right. Just to see and that they still have safe electronic transmissions. Right. And and Kemmer could consider something like that. I did not think that it was necessary because every time a new antenna comes in, it's checked again. So unless something, every time something is changed, we get a new check. So I didn't think we needed to go back over some time period and, and require these reports. Right, and it would be time consuming for the city and for the private entity. And I think with, with technology, and I think they're updating this frequently enough that it's probably, that's in itself a sufficient check for public right. safety on transmission risk. But I open the floor if any other commissioners have comments on that. Commissioner, Vice I, Chair. Actually, I, I, I might have a little mm -hmm. different view. Okay. Um, so just this is um, this is probably not a very uh, you know uh, intelligent question. But do the RF levels are they consistent once the facility is in operation? They don't change. They're the same amount throughout the life of the facility. I would assume that they are, but I am not an expert, I, and <laughs> I have no idea. Can, maybe can. Uh, yes, they, when near reports are prepared, they're done at a worst case scenario, maximum power output, uh, maximum exposure. Um, so they, they do consider that. And typically, you know, a site that's over 10 meters, I mean, you know, they're categorically exempt from some of the uh, reporting requirements. But most, like a 60 foot tower, typically, you know, the worst case scenario would be, you know, maybe a tenth of a percent of the FCC limit. So. In terms of the uh, exposure FCC limit on exposure for, for example, maximum possible exposure, yeah. Based on that, I'm sorry. What was the uh, distance? You said ten. Oh, I was just talking about. There are certain reporting requirements that the FCC has for, uh, regardless of whether or not the the city has FCC standards. We have to comply with FCC. We regularly test our facilities. There's all sorts of things that we do, um, just for our own compliance reasons. Um, but uh, sites that are over 10 meters typically don't have the same uh, burden of testing requirements because the maximum permissible exposure is so low um, anyway. Okay. So. so any city review are you suggesting would be redundant then to what you already collect for the FCC in terms of uh, data on exposures and that? Every is city, that in, yeah, every city in Washington state that had a testing requirement for has gotten rid of it to my knowledge. Uh, and that includes Woodenville. You, you mean an ongoing testing? Yeah, once they had it's a, an operation. Okay. Yeah, because for example, in Woodenville, they had the similar requirement, and they got rid of it just because there's kind of you know they, there are reports that may sit on a shelf, and we're upgrading our site so frequently, as, as she she mentioned, that they're they're obsolete the second that they're done. So, yeah. So the cost outweighs the benefits of this ongoing data collection, in, yeah. in your view, and also in. Yeah, there's a question of enforcement too, whether or not the um, the city can, you know, really revoke a permit or say that we're out of compliance, uh, whether or not that's uh, allowed by the FCC, given that they actually have no regulatory authority over uh, things like emissions. But, you know, and I won't comment on that. I don't, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. So, but from a practical standpoint, I, I would agree with staff. And there's there's little reason above the constant testing and constant reports we produce for these that it would make sense to do, but in my view, yeah. Okay, I'm good. All right, thank you, Vice Chair. Anybody else? Any, yes, what Commissioner question? Vanderlein. I, earlier we you spoke of there's a, a, a distance requirement from a pole to a residential. 33 feet. 33 feet. Uh, okay, so we're looking at uh, the RF impact of 17 feet to 49 feet. I was just wondering if there's a relationship there. 
that we need to think about? The, um, again, even if we determined the material was provided just to talk about what it is, but in terms of I guess that's my regulating my based on that. Is this set within rule that we can't impact? I believe so. FCC rules. Yeah, in terms of regulating. And what, where the 33 feet came from, I don't know. I don't know because I, I'm not sure we can. But it's in the rule. It's not our but, number. No, no, it's, it's our number. In the zoning code, it says it has to be 33 feet from uh, schools and residences. But your point, Mike, is if the risk is out to 49 feet, why don't we amend the rule to go to 49 <coughs> feet? And, we, and I'm saying that we can't regulate based, we can't, um, in fact, I'll go back to uh, a local government, local government may not regulate placement, construction, and modification of facilities on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions. <coughs> I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I don't know why that's in there, in the existing rule. <coughs> we can't change the 33 feet based upon RF, but we could change 30 feet based upon the fact that the sun's going to come up tomorrow morning. I suppose. How about aesthetics? Aesthetics, right. <laughs> when in doubt, when in doubt, <coughs> invoke aesthetics. <laughs> I, I apologize for being flip. I just no. I, I, there just seems to be a disconnect between a point. number that we can <laughs> control agree. versus a number that that seem to be coming out of the FCC that this is the range of risk. I agree. And if the FCC says the range of risk is at 49 feet, Why I think we our there? setback ought to be somewhere around 49 feet. Maybe 50. Maybe 50. Maybe 49. <laughs> it's not 30. I'm, I'm good with 50. Is a nice and memorable number. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. We're not going to talk All about right. those feet anymore. Or could we not talk about those feet? <laughs> Mike made a good point. That's, I think, and I appreciate it. Uh, do you want to propose something, or can we? I'd like to propose that we change the 33 to. Or look into changing? Look into, you know, is there some reason why we wouldn't do that, or why do we, would we feel comfortable it's, with 33, which is less than? So, Mike, where, where exactly are you reading this? I am looking at number so, five on page seven. Second to last paragraph. Second to, yeah, paragraph. It reads, the impact distance of most communication facilities antennas range from 17 feet to 49 feet, depending on the type of facility. And actually, the, the first sentence I think is important too is it says the greatest RF impact from communication facilities is in a horizontal plane out from the facility. Right. So, a horizontal plane out from the facility, but these facilities are up in the air, and it's a horizontal plane out from the facility. So, I don't think it, it does relate to that 33 foot requirement. Because we're talking about if the antennas are, are 80 feet up in the air, it's a horizontal plane out from that. It's not coming but, down to the ground. If it's 80 feet in the air, couldn't they be shorter and then be within the, be, be where at, at a height low enough to affect people who are, you know, in a 35 foot house or apartment building? If they were, then the FCC regulations would apply. For example, M Mr. Grinnell pointed out that if there were an RF issue because the antenna was lower, that they would be responsible for the screening and dealing with the impacts by their FCC requirements. Okay. Are you good? Yeah. I, I, yeah that's I, what I was looking for. Is there some requirement okay. to, to address that? And if what, what you're saying is that if there is in the testing reveals that there's an interference out to 49 feet and there's a residential property impacted it. There's, there's, that's, that's going to be addressed as part of the 
part of the permitting process? So we get the reports from the engineers who talk about those issues, interference, RF radiation, et cetera. And those reports have to conform to FCC standards for those issues. And if they don't conform, then it's an FCC issue. It's not really a city issue. It's an FCC um, compliance issue. I'm satisfied. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Shrevenick? Well, I, was, I mean, I, I guess I'm fine with this. It'd be nice to know where the 33 came from. But, I'll see if yeah, I can I figure mean, it out. That's, <laughs> but that won't impede my vote on this. But <laughs> Okay. All right. And I can understand it is late, and I know that we're trying to wrap this up. He knows the answer, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Sorry, the 33 feet is a 10 meter uh, I mentioned. That's the same distance of what I was mentioning earlier about the threshold at which the FCC requires an EA. So, again, you know, that's where the anything above uh, 10 meters is categorically exempt from having to do an EA, a near report, basically, for the for the FCC's purposes. Of course, the city still requires it, you know, currently. Make sense? No. Good. I don't understand. Yeah. I, yeah. Could you clarify that? <laughs> I, I, I. At least a couple of us don't understand. <laughs> yeah. So we have a whole set of regulatory requirements that we have to comply with. In this case, would be FCC rules um, related to pre preparation of our own um, RF um, emissions uh, reports for their purposes, and the 10 meters is the threshold by which, if we are above 10 meters. Uh, in and height? In height. Okay. Then we are categorically exempt from providing an environmental assessment, which is basically what a near report is uh, for their purposes. If we are beneath 10 meters, then we have to provide in a, a near report environmental assessment. So that's where that 10 meter, 33 feet comes from. I thought the 10 meter, I thought the 33 feet was horizontal. in the horizontal plane. Right. So that doesn't address, it's different. It's, it's, the 33 feet, it, it, that's the, it's the 10 meter. Now the 17 to 49 feet for horizontal plane, I, I don't know where that came no. from. So well, anyway, I couldn't answer that question. Yeah. I was Sorry. talking about the city regulation that was 33 meters, excuse me, 33 feet in the horizontal plane. Right. Yeah. So. I, I don't know. know. That yeah. I don't know where it came yeah. from either. Unless there's a different 10 meter standard out there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'll, so I'll, I'll check on it. Yeah. Yeah. Same amount of space. Yeah. yeah, I'll check on it and see if I can find any information. Yeah. All right. Possible. Anything else? I know it's late. I know you're weary. Um, is there any new business? Any comment? We've exhausted the agenda. Lori, please. I just wanted to remind you that your next meeting, which would typically be the 16th, the 16th is canceled because the city council is meeting that evening. Uh, so your next meeting will be the first meeting in March. Right. And then there's a, the council's going to take up at the next meeting the docket? Yes. That's correct. Yeah. Go ahead. Do ask. Do we have any idea what the potential docket might look like? You do, and it's actually uploaded um, to the council agenda. So you can go online and you can read the packet um, with the staff recommendation in there. So we'll kind of get an idea of what this year will look like. You, you will get an idea of what the, the staff is recommending for the, for the docket work program. Um, whether the council accepts that or not, that's what we'll find out on the 8th. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else, Deborah? March 1st. Okay. Vice Chair? You do. I think you might. Yeah, this is just for information. Maybe everybody knows about it. There's a meeting, uh, I'm wrong, the State Parks and Recreation Commission next Tuesday, I believe here, on the St. Edwards Seminary project. Right. That's a, kind of a Daniels. big deal, I right. believe, if anyone's interested in is that, do I have my facts right on that? Is that, it's that's, Tuesday? That's, February 9th. It's, it's next Tuesday. It, it's, a, it's a meeting that's hosted by the state. It's for, for their purposes, but it's been held in Kenmore. Here, Correct. right? Here. Here, okay. Yes. Yeah. And it starts at? I, I believe it starts at 6.30. And I understand there's a 400-person cap on attendance. 
and seriously, yeah, and um, it and will it'll fill, probably fill up fill up quickly. So if you're attending, uh, come early. And there's uh, yeah. auxiliary parking located in various commercial areas. I think that was in an email I got from Nancy today. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Commissioners Orenshaw and Mulcair. Anything else? All right, there being no new business, I hereby adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody.